Hey, what a nice clean kitchen. Oh, I mean, what a nice 8-track stereo cartridge tape recorder. <laughs> Hello and welcome back. So, yeah, today we're taking a look at this 8-track recorder. So I'd actually featured this in a prior video on the, the previous 8-track video to this because I used this to record uh, the music I needed right at the end there. And I had to, I mean, you'll see what I did to get it working. I put in the bare minimum effort because I knew I'd fix this up later. Uh, so testing this out right now with an a track I have. So you can hear it doesn't sound great and that pause mechanism is not working correctly. So it'll kind of jam up and it won't undo itself. And the program button's not changing, so the head's not moving. Fast forward seems to be working fine though. I do love how it, it still still plays it when you're fast forwarding it. So, got a bit to fix. So I'm going to start with taking the uh, back of this thing off. And so I don't know if I mentioned it, but this is a realistic branded. You can see that on the back. So Radio Shack made it. Um, I don't know if eight track recorders are very common. I'm going to guess they weren't. Uh, but yeah, let me know if any of you guys. Uh, used a track recorders but uh and I, I don't know why i took off the back I, I i've been inside of this i i knew that's not how you get into it you take the you take the uh, the feet off and then there's that one screw that you take off uh, and then it'll just slide out from this uh wood box and oh that's serendipitous So yeah, let me uh, let me know if you guys have uh, used these before. Pretty clean inside, very stoutly built, nice all metal inside. Yeah, you gotta you like my fix. <laughs> I didn't have a belt, but I got the belt that was in it fixed. So I just folded it over itself and glued it. And that that seemed to keep it working. So you can see there that the uh, belt for the tape counter wasn't moving. So I figured it was just a bad belt. It's not. Uh, anyways, I'm going to start with removing this pulley. So I was trying to get this big flywheel out, and I figured this was a good way to start. This is, of course, Loctite it in. Uh, this this entire thing is, is just, I think, 40% of this machine is Loctite. But a little bit of heat always helps with that. So once I get that done, I can finally unscrew this. Being careful not to destroy any... Of these set screws I do that far too often <laughs> so a little bit of wiggling started started to get moving and I can finally get it out of there and that didn't help at all it's like oh man it's full of Loctite in there you can see it gooped up in there so just more heat melt that Loctite and a little bit of twisting and it pops off. And that led us nowhere. There is no reason to remove that. <laughs> uh, in fact, if I would have looked at all, I would have seen that the uh, flywheel is held on by this kind of pin in the bottom. So it's it's has a groove cut into the side and then this pin is driven um, through that and that's what's holding it in. And so one of the sides has got this like putty epoxy stuff on it so I got that removed I'm going to try to just push it through so I'm trying to get from this direction first uh, but that was that was the wrong approach because it's actually knurled on that side so when I pushed from the other side it, it did pop out and then I could just pull it the rest of the way out on the uh, smooth shaft of it kind of a interesting way to hold that in I think you can see that groove that uh, on the bottom that's holding it in. So I'm just going to remove this just to get it out of the way and uh, clean it better. Get some uh, grease in it eventually. So two screws there and then uh, one screw there. And this screw started out fine and uh, then it stopped spinning. I don't know what happened to it. It stopped spinning and boy howdy I massacred that screw trying to get it removed. It like cross-threaded itself as I was removing it. I don't know what I did. 
It, it did not live, though. It was her first casualty. <laughs> so, and then looking at this pause mechanism, trying to figure out what's going on here. So you press it in. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it doesn't. And that's the actual latching mechanism. And you can see how it catches up. So that time it worked. And other times it'll just move, move. Yep, nothing, nothing. There it goes. So yeah, just old grease in there. So we'll get that under control. And then we have the solenoid. So this is what's activating that program button. So it's changing the tracks. And this uh, accentuated cam on the right side should be pushing this pin up and down, moving the head up and down. But it was completely jammed. So I'd have to get this head out of the way. And we also have the motor being kind of loud. Hopefully you could hear that. And then lastly, the timer is actually jammed up on itself. It wasn't a bad belt. It, you can see the wheel will spin, and then it'll stop spinning. It'll get jammed up. So we've got to figure out what's wrong with that as well. And then I found this weird thing, too, when I was messing around. Some kind of... I, I, I have no idea what this is. It's some kind of spider something. It's like an egg. I don't know. That might be a uh, hint of what else we find in here. <laughs> But, yeah, so just to summarize, we got motor to fix up. We have the pause mechanism that's not working great. We have the tape counter that we need to fix up. And that's actually, it's not, a, it's not technically a tape counter. It's like a timer. It's kind of interesting. It's not just an arbitrary number. It's actually minutes and seconds. But we're starting with the motor. So it has this kind of um, vibration dampening case on it so it's held between these two silicon pads one on the bottom one on the top but i can just pull it out of the case and uh, that exposes the uh, leads we can see 24th of august 79 was when this was made so this is a pretty old device so i'm just going to desolder the motor to make it easier to uh, take apart so my plan here is just oh, i'll take apart the motor and uh re-lubricate it get new oil in it and uh Boy, this was a lot harder than I thought. So you can hear it really squeaking in there. It, it, yeah, it definitely needs to be lubricated. So I'm going to start by just cleaning off this solder. Not really necessary, but just to make uh, my life easier when I have to re-solder it later on. Just sucking that solder off. And then that was a pretty big blob on this bent over tab. So I'm just trying to finally clean it up. So my first approach to take apart this motor were these tabs. So these are the only things I really see. And I'm trying to just bend these up to see if that maybe lets the motor slide out. It didn't. So I'm removing this plastic uh, covering and it has this metal shielding on it, I guess. I'm not really certain what that would be, um, but I'm guessing it's some kind of electromagnetic interference shielding something. So next plan was like, oh, maybe this bent over tab is holding it up. And now at this part, I really should have realized it was like somewhat soldered down at this point, but I kept forcing it and then I, I bent it over and it, whoops. Uh, whoops. <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I kind of uh, destroyed that tab on accident, but we'll press on. So turns out I just had to bend the actual body of the motor a bit and it'll pop out. And had to take that pulley off the top and this can all slide on out. And so that were the, those were the tabs that I had bent over previously. So that was not necessary to do. And in fact, that turned out to be a nightmare to get back in place uh, and bent over and held tightly enough so that it wasn't rattling. But that's that's... Yeah, we're, we're not even at that part yet. We're still taking the motor apart. So it's actually, it's a brushed motor, which makes sense. I, I was surprised. I was ah, there's little brushes in here, but I'm at the time, little small DC brushless motors. I don't think were a thing. So those brushes look fairly worn. Maybe, I don't know, maybe not. Uh, commutator is not too dirty, but I am cleaning it off. Uh, some of that carbon buildup with just some isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip. And then trying to get to this bearing right at the uh, bottom. Or it's more of a bushing, I should say. 
So, got those two bushings out of the way, and I'm just soaking this all in uh, um, naphtha, just to degrease it, get any old grease that might be in there. So, got those cleaned and brushed off. And I'm just putting a little bit of oil in these. I don't know what the best thing to put in these is, if it's oil or grease, I just went with some oil. Uh, and at this point, that's when I realized I put the wrong bushing in down there because they're actually different. And I checked my footage and I was like, oh, it's the, the one with the deep groove V and it should be there. And here you can see that top bushing isn't held in very tightly. So I had to, of course, redo that. Uh, what, what I'm showing you doing with this motor is like half of the what I actually did. I think I took this thing apart three or four times trying to get it uh, perfectly working. And my original plan with this broken tab was to just get some solder on the end of the metal sticking up. So I'm getting some flux uh, to help me with doing that. And uh, luckily the, the solder actually grabbed onto that pretty easily. And I managed to get a little, a little bead of it there. And so my next plan was to just solder the old tab back on. It's, it's not going well for me though. I think my problem was the soldering iron was too um, low of a temperature and it was just sucking the heat off into the chassis of the motor. So I eventually just got rid of that tab entirely and just soldered all the wires directly to that little bit of uh, solder there. And that seemed to work fine and get the motor back in place. And now we can start taking a look at the head. So first mistake is I removed that screw on the left. That was not necessary. That screw is the head adjustment. So I'll have to fix that later. So that is what makes sure that the head is on the correct part of the tape. So it'll just twist it in and out of place. So lastly, the head is held in by that E-clip on the bottom through this uh, shaft. And once that's out of the way, I can pull this whole thing out and take a look at this plunger. So again, this plunger is interacting with that eccentric cam below it. And we can see that there. So as that solenoid switches and uh, rotates this, it'll either lower or raise the head. And so the spring there is making it so that it's always trying to be pulled down against this uh, cam. And so as it rotates, it'll push it up. So taking this all apart and I can finally get access to this from both sides. And I just sprayed some WD-40 on it and let it soak for a little bit and then got some uh, pliers on it and started prying on it and it started to move. It was, I had to put quite a lot of force on that to get it to move and it, it didn't look galled or anything. I think it's just old grease just turned to glue eventually. So just jamming a uh, Q-tip down there trying to clean that out. Uh, and I cleaned this for uh, quite a while. But I did get it um, pretty well cleaned up. And if we just drop it in, yeah, it just falls right through. So got that all working again. And while I had everything out, figured that would be a good time just to get it all cleaned up. There's lots of little bit of that kind of gray molybdenum grease just sprayed on the inside of this. I don't know if that was from the factory or if someone did that at some point, uh, but cleaning off this uh, plastic cam as well, just taking some of that old grease off. And just putting it back in place. It's kind of interesting the uh, how this works. It has that, uh, that circuit board and has those uh, metal not brushes. I'm not sure what you'd call those, but just telling it the relative position of it and I think that's what's determining those lights on the above the uh, receptacle. So you can see as I pull that in it's uh, rotating that cam. So with that all back in place just get a little grease on there so that's just uh, that white uh, molybdenum grease. So a tiny amount on the left part of the shaft and then just gob it on to the right side. And let's take a look at the, uh, the actual head itself. It looks really good there's like no corrosion it doesn't look like there's much wear there's a little bit on the bottom of it but yeah the head looks like it's in really good condition so i can start putting this whole thing back together so i put a little bit of oil on that a little bit of oil on the uh, shaft for the head and just snapping it all back into place and finally have to put this uh, e-clip back on this was actually quite a pain to do but i managed to get it back on and we can see 
It's working correctly, so that's what it's supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be moving up and down the tape, changing the uh, heads on it. So now to ch uh, fix the pause button and the tape counter, I have to take the faceplate off. And I needed to do this anyway to clean it well. So it has six screws on the back and then just the the one knob has to be taken off. That this uh, plastic ring doesn't need to doesn't need to move. Now the VU meters seem to be glued to the front of the uh, uh, the front panel. So I'm just desoldering them. And then of, of course the, the glue failed on the right one, but it still held on to the uh, left one. So and then it's just these two screws holding in the pause mechanism. So I had to take the knob off uh, to even access that top screw, but I would have had to take it off anyway to uh, pull this out. So just a spring to remove and we can get a look at this. So looks like it's just some bad grease on it. Just got too old. And while I was at it, I figured I might as well take a look at the record button on the left because it has that same uh, grease on it. So I figured that could be cleaned off as well. This doesn't have any kind of latching something or lat latching mechanism, so it really wasn't necessary. Um, but I figured I might as well. And I might as well clean off this switch as well. So I just got some contact cleaner in there and just ran it through a few times. I didn't hear any crackling when I was recording stuff with this before, but yeah, it's good practice nonetheless. So this is pretty easy to come apart. Just has a couple springs on it and just pops out. So get that old grease cleaned off. And I got these out of the wash. So I just put these in the ultrasonic cleaner for a little while. And then I ended up just, I think I just used contact cleaner to degrease them. That actually works really well as a, a degreaser. You just kind of, it's almost like brake clean and how it, uh, the grease just runs off of it. So I got some new, uh, new grease on all those parts where the metal's touching the metal. And just getting this all screwed back together. So that was pretty simple to do. And... Now we have the mechanism all clean. So you can see it's running way better uh, with that grease removed. So I did put a tiny amount of grease on it, but not too much because I didn't want it to start jamming up again. So we can see it's not working great. So the way that pause mechanism works is it just kicks out the tape away from the head a little bit. And then it has a switch that also turns off the motor at the same time. So now we can finally take a look at this uh, tape timer. Yeah, it's not because it's not a counter. It's it's yeah. You can see it says 50 on there. It's 50 seconds. So two screws on the back to remove this. And looking closely at this, you can see that yellow line right at the top. And that to me looks like a crack. And more specifically, it looks to me like old glue. And right there. So if I pause and zoom in, you can see on the right tooth of the gear, it's right on top of the screw and that's where it's jamming up. So the gear is basically splayed open there and it's not meshing with the screw anymore. So it's jamming up and it'll do it when you reverse it as well. And here's a better view. You can see the glue there, pretty mangled. So kind of out of luck, but not quite. Luckily, we live in the future, and I'm able to just model and print out a uh, replacement for this. So that's really nice to be able to do that in like 45 minutes. And believe it or not, it worked first try. I guesstimated with the Helix on that gear, and it was perfect. I didn't have to print it off again. I didn't have to model it again. It was the first try. It was such a relief. And yeah, it just works. It works perfectly fine. I got the same number of teeth on it, so the timing should be correct. And I, of course, you always print a bunch of them. And I'm going to have an STL for this. If by some miraculous reason you have one of these with the same problem, you can print off a replacement for that or uh, have someone print it off. But that's all the problems addressed, so we can start uh, assembling this back together. 
So putting this back in place, I figured I better Loctite it together so it's just as hard for the next guy to take it apart and discover that there's no reason to take it apart as well. <laughs> so got that back on. And I used uh, some grease at the base of the, uh, uh, I guess, the receptacle for it. Sometimes I think there's a felt pad there. Uh, but not not in this case. It didn't look like there's any remnants of one. So again, I just used some grease, and I got some new belts for it. And we can see it's working great. Pause mechanism works. The tape counters, counting tape. Yeah, there's good uh, good view of it. Yeah, really interesting that it's it's a timer, which I like. I like that more than the like the arbitrary just tape counter that's on most uh, car uh, cassettes, cassette decks. Fast forward's working great. Yeah, again, I love that it just, it keeps playing it when you fast forward it, that's really funny to me. But now yeah, we can start uh, start cleaning this. It, it really is, it's not that dirty, so it shouldn't take too much cleaning. So I can pop this plastic uh, thing off the front. I'm guessing this is just you would just rotate this to whatever levels you normally have the record at so you can remember. I'm not I'm not really certain. I mean, I figured you would always just keep your record levels where you typically do and not change them that much, but I don't know. And you can see that kind of metal ring had fallen down uh, and it was just glued on. So I'll have to re-glue that back into place. And hinted at this before, but yeah, we got we got some visitors inside of this. We have a very old spider trapped up in there, and then we have this nightmare, which I think is a nest. And I'm like, oh, look at that. I'm pretty sure those are spider eggs. I'm not certain though, but that is that's really gross. Actually, I'm not an arachnophobe, but that yeah, I should have cleaned that immediately. I didn't even think about what that was when I saw it at first. Yeah, this, that's that's pretty gross. This, this is the second thing that I've taken apart that I found spiders in. I think spiders just love living in these hi-fi units. Nice and dark and warm inside of them. <laughs> so I got that all cleaned out. Um, and yeah, it, it came together pretty, pretty well. These knobs impressed me. They're, they're just chromed plastic. But if you look at the front of them, they have the markings as if they were machined. I don't know how they do that. I don't know if that's molded into the plastic or if that's they do that when they chrome it i don't know it that was i don't know that impressed me especially you know doing that in um 1979 so i just hot glued the vu meters back in they were glued or taped in before and so i just did the same uh hot glue is a pretty not permanent thing so i figured that wasn't too big a deal and then I just got some actual permanent glue and put it on this ring. And I thought the ring was a lot bigger, so I, I had a lot of uh, excess I had to remove. But really no big deal. And then uh, one of my favorite parts about this is cleaning the wooden box. Or this is a vinyl wrapped uh, wooden box. But it, it always just looks so much better once you do this. Because the tops of these boxes just take the brunt of whatever grime there maybe and they just immediately brighten and shine up when you do that so we can start putting this thing all back together so put the front panel back on get the knobs back on i do i do like these uh the knobs they stay together really well um and they they do come apart when you want them to but otherwise um they're not they're not too i don't know how to put it but some of the cassette stuff i have and of course i <laughs> it's on. <laughs> it's just, yeah, <laughs> I had to put the those on before I put the front panel on that I didn't realize. But as I was saying, some of the knobs sometimes they they'll rotate independently of each other too easily, and it's just kind of a pain to make sure the levels stay the same. And finally, we just slide it in through the front, and then we can just get the feet back on, and yeah, finally get this thing put back together. Yeah, so I hope you guys all enjoyed this. It was a pretty yeah, easy fix, I guess. Pretty explicit what was wrong with it. All mechanical stuff, old grease, 
Uh, biggest problem was just that cracked uh, gear. But uh, yeah, other than that, we can give it a real test. And with that, I thank you for watching and uh, have a nice day. Now, I just wanted to get a couple closing thoughts in about this 8-track recorder, because it, it surprised me. Um, I had expectations going into this that what it recorded wouldn't sound good, because what I had recorded pri previously on this didn't really sound that good. I think that was a result of kind of, this is a bad tape that I recorded over. This is a lot better tape. Uh, it sounds a lot better. But I would say this sounds better than cassette, uh, significantly so. It, there's basically no noise that I can hear of. Uh, I'm recording these... Uh, pretty hot this is kind of a quiet part of the song and i am recording this right now uh but i i recorded it to where it was peaking a lot of the time and it just it sounds great but in terms of convenience it is so much less convenient than a cassette to use because you can't rewind it that is that, that is so annoying that you can't rewind these and it makes sense if you look at the how just these are designed, it's a continuous loop, so you can't, you'll just unspiral it if you go the wrong way. But when you're trying to get something recorded and you, you want to get it out of a specific part um, of the tape, it, it's like, it's not going to happen. You just have to, you, you would have to be sitting just listening to it and then just hit pause right when you uh, got to the part. Because if you miss that part, you got to just cycle through it again. Now this does have a fast forward. It's it's generous with that term. It's not very fast. It's definitely just more forward than general than usual. Um, but and I should state just how do you record with this? So that record button on the left, you basically just hold it in and then you put a cassette in or a cartridge in, and it'll start recording it. I think those two copper uh, leaves that we saw inside of that. I think that's some kind of write protect system. Now, none of the eight track cartridges I have have any kind of notches in there to allow or disallow recording. Maybe those are just like the, the blank ones you could get that had that and you could like pop them out. But yeah, these don't care. You can just record over them. Um, so I, I apologize, Duke Ellington. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, again, it's just, it sounds great. I'm curious because I think the way that you would typically have used this way back in the day is you just hook this up to a radio and a timer and stuff. And when your radio program came on that you wanted to record, you would have that set on your timer and this would just automatically start recording. But because of how eight tracks work, you would have gaps in it because it, It'll get to the end of its program, stop for a little bit, could chunk, move to the next uh, track, and then start up again. I don't know how long that would take, maybe like five, ten, maybe five seconds of audio, maybe ten seconds. And that seems to be, that, that, that seems like it would be really annoying to listen back on. Maybe it wouldn't be that bad. But uh, I'm curious if anyone, uh, if anyone actually used Atrex as a, as a recording, if they were like a hipster of their day, not using cassettes. Because I don't, I don't think this was ever that big of a thing. Uh, it, cassettes are just so much more convenient. Um, but yeah, in terms of sound quality, I think these went out. But that should be it. So I uh, thank you all for watching and have a nice day.